It's 7 p.m. January 6, 1930, Chicago, Illinois. Millionaire Charles M. Richter, vice president of the Consolidation Magazine Corporation, is in his home at 1418 Lakeshore Drive in Chicago's Gold Coast. He was preparing for dinner with his wife when the doorbell rang. The parlor maid Catherine Welsh opened the door to find two men in overcoats, their collars up, trying to fight off the Chicago Hawk. One of the men said, Mr. Randall for Mr. Richter. He's upstairs dressing, but I'll get him, the maid responded. Charles Richter dressed and came to the door. When he turned the knob to release the lock, a man shoved his foot in the door and two men bust in and shoved pistols into the millionaire's belly. And one of them said, steady now, Mr. Richter. You know what we want. Now turn around and lead us in. That night, five crooks got away with $25,000 in cash and jewels. The story made the front page of the news. No one knew then that it would only be the first headline of a crime committed by the future public enemy number one, Lester Joseph Gillis, better known as George Babyface Nelson. Hey, you guys, gals, and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. All right, today I'm going to switch it up a little bit. We're going to leave the big city and take a look at one of the gangsters who made headlines terrorizing the small towns in the Midwest during the early 30s. He wasn't a polished gangster like Louis Lepke, who would take over unions or set up a distribution network like Waxy Gordon. He was a throwback to the days of Jesse James. He walked into a bank, guns blazing, took the loot, and shot his way out of town. The man known as George Babyface Nelson was born Lester Joseph Gillis on December 6, 1908, on Chicago's South Side to Joseph and Marie Nelson. Lester was the last of seven kids born to the couple. The chubby cheek blonde haired baby became the apple of his mother's eyes. Those eyes would never see the bad in her baby boy. Even when he became public enemy number one, she refused to believe that he would ever shoot anyone. He was a small sickly kid who loved animals and was constantly bringing home strays. When Lester started getting into trouble as a youth, his mother was convinced that he was always taking the rap for his friends. Lester began running the streets as a little kid, tagging behind his older brothers getting into mischief in the nearby stockyards. He began skipping school and was sent to St. Patrick's boarding school. Young Lester rebelled against the nuns in their strict brand of justice. One night he ran away. It was pouring rain and he took shelter in a barn where he found a kitten and tried his best to keep them both warm. The next day, a truck driver gave him a ride back to Chicago. Lester was transferred again, and again he began to miss school and run in the streets with other delinquents. Soon he joined a gang run by two older Italian kids, Anthony Capizio and future Chicago boss, Anthony Tough Tony Accardo. Even though Lester was the smallest in the gang, and as an adult he would only grow to 5'5 and 133 pounds, he never backed down from a fight, and he earned the respect of the gang. He would be a key component in the gang's operation. Because of his baby face, his job was to distract the store owner while the rest of the gang stole. Soon as truancy was discovered, and he was labeled a habitual truant and was sent to the parental boarding school for wayward boys. Here he fell in line, and he was released in 1921. On the 4th of July, Lester was playing in the friend's garage when they found a gun that belonged to the friend's father. They took the gun outside, and Lester, pretending to be a cowboy, accidentally shot his friend in the face. The bullet lodged in the boy's jaw. He would survive. The family was forced to pay for the child's medical bills, and Lester was sent to the Cook County Jail for boys for 18 months. Again, he fell in line and was given weekend furloughs home. On one of those weekends home, him and the pal decided they were not going back. They decided to head to Florida, and the pair stole a car and headed south. But not far out of town, they ran out of gas. Lester was returned, and six months was added to his sentence. When he was released, he was only free for a few months before he went back after he was convicted of borrowing a neighbor's car and taking it on a joyride. He returned back to the streets in April of 1924. He linked up with his old gang who were making money by stealing cars, stripping them, and selling the parts. At the end of the summer, 15-year-old Lester was again arrested by the cops. Pulled over in a car full of kids, Lester argued that he didn't know that the car was stolen. The judge didn't want to hear it, and it was back to the reformatory. This time while he was away, his father took his own life after years of suffering from depression. In 1925, when Lester got back, the roar of the 20s was deafening. Everyone was getting rich. Lester struggled to find his place in the underworld. He got a job at an auto dealership, but he wasn't living a completely straight life. He allowed a gang of tired thieves to use the place as a headquarters. Soon he was back in the reformatory after stealing another car. He was offered a deal of probation if he ratted out his friends. He refused and spent another 12 months behind the wall. This time when he was released, he was 18 years old and he was warned that the next time he gets in trouble, he'll be going to big boy jail. 
Lester joined some of his pals and tried to run a still. But before they could make any profit, one of the partners ran off with the corn mash they were going to use to make the booze. The neighborhood Lester grew up in was run by the Tui gang, and Roger Tui was its leader. Lester did some transporting for the gang to make a few bucks, and in the late spring of 28, Lester was in the toy section of the Goldblatt department store when he met the Bonnie to his Clyde. Helen Wozniak was tiny. She stood about 4'11 with brown hair and blue eyes. The two instantly fell in love, but Helen was only 15. Lester asked her to marry him, but her father forbade it. A few months later, the pair would elope to Indiana after Helen turned up pregnant. Lester promptly robbed the Cicero jewelry store and gave Helen a beautiful ring and used the rest to get the family a new place to stay. On April 27, 1929, Helen gave birth to Ronald Vincent Gillis. Lester got a job, but was still moonlighting as a criminal. The pressure got worse a few months later when Helen told him that she was pregnant again. Lester hooked up with former Tui gangster Stanton Randall, a guy twice his size who had done 10 years for robbery, and Harry Powell. Both men were twice his age, but they all had something in common. They were broke. On January 6, 1930, the crime spree of Lester Gillis would begin. When they entered the house of Charles Richter, the gang herded Mr. Richter and the servants into the living room and cut the phone lines. When Mrs. Richter came downstairs, she was unaware of what was going on until the pistol was aimed at her. Mr. Richter calmed his wife and said, it's a hold up there. Now don't get excited. Give these men anything they ask for. The bandits went upstairs and took the Richters for 25 grand in jewels. Then they bound the family with tape and escaped. Two weeks later, two men knocked on the rear door of the home of Stuart J. Templeton, a wealthy attorney at 1388 North Green Bay Road in Lake Forest. When 18-year-old Selma Wirtala opened the door, one of the men told her that they were interior decorators coming to make estimates on future work. While they were talking, another man appeared and put a revolver to her stomach. They forced her inside. They made Selma take them upstairs to where the jewelry was and then tied Selma and another maid, Bertie Horan, to chairs and put the Templeton baby that she was watching into a crib and got away with $5,000 in jewelry. The gang laid low for a while, but enough is never enough. And on April 1st, they were back at it. Mrs. Lottie Von Bulow was on the second floor of her mansion at 5839 Sheridan Road talking with her sister and her brother-in-law. The doorbell rang and her brother-in-law went downstairs and opened it. He found two men who said that they were census workers. Mrs. Bulow heard the conversation from upstairs and told her brother-in-law to bring him up. When they got to the top of the steps, he turned and saw that there were now four men and they were wearing masks and holding pistols. The four men rushed into the room and they tied Mrs. Von Bulow, her sister and her brother-in-law up. Two of the men went back downstairs and tied up the maid and the chauffeur. While they were tying up the hostages, one of them noticed a photo of Lottie's husband and said, that's her husband. We should wait for him and bump him off. Don't you do any of this sort, Lottie said. Take what you want, but you're going too far when you bring my husband into it. Lester said then, where's your money? She said it's in the safe, but I don't have the key. When her husband arrived, they tied him up too, and they relieved him of his platinum watch and got away with $50,000 in jewels. Lester used his share to get a new house in Cicero, and he paid cash for a new Chrysler. At this time, Lester began to introduce himself as George Nelson. May 11, Helen gave birth to a baby girl named Darlene Helen Gillis. But in October, the gang again was having money problems. The publicity of the home invasions made it hard to sell the jewels. So Lester and his gang graduated to bank robbery. On October 3rd, Lester, Randall, and Powell took a trip to DuPage County, 15 miles northwest of Chicago. They waited in the car outside the state bank at Itasca for the manager to open up. At 9 a.m., the bank manager and a female teller came and opened the bank for business. Moments later, two men entered the bank. One approached the counter and asked to buy a money order. The teller reached down to grab the slip, and when he looked up, he was staring down a barrel of a 45 automatic. Powell hopped over the counter while Lester held the two at gunpoint. The manager opened the safe, and Powell stuffed the dough into a pillowcase. Lester said, don't move for 10 minutes, and the pair walked outside, hopped into the waiting car, and sped off. The haul was $4,700, not bad for the Depression. A month later, the gang was back at it. This time, they targeted the Plainsville State Bank in Plainsville, Illinois. When Lester and Powell entered the bank, the manager smelled something, and he retreated to the cashier's cage and locked the door. When Lester pulled his gun and announced there was a stick-up, the manager smiled. Lester fired a 45 slug into the glass, but it ricocheted off. The bank had been robbed five months before and had installed bulletproof glass to protect the money. Lester and Powell fired seven more shots into the glass with no success. 
When the manager grabbed the shotgun and stuck it through the gun port, the pair hauled it out of there empty-handed. On November 22, 1930, the gang walked into the Hillside Bank in Cicero shortly after 9 a.m. and walked out with four grand in cash. Six weeks later, a police informant told the cops that it was Lester and his gang who were pulling off the home invasions. Powell was arrested first, and then Randall and his wife. In the early hours on March 1st, Lester was home in his bed sleeping. His wife was not home and his kids were in the other room. Outside of his apartment door, seven Chicago police were debating whether to knock or bust down the door. They decided to take the door. When the door came crashing in, Lester sat up and said, Who the hell are you guys? Then he announced themselves as police and told them that he was under arrest. But Lester refused to go anywhere. His kids would be left alone. So two detectives stayed behind until his sister came to get him. The three men, along with four others, were charged with the Templeton and Von Bulo robberies, as well as robbery of a jewelry store. And Lester was suspected in a robbery of Chicago Mayor Big Bill Thompson's wife for $16,000 on October 7th on the Gold Coast. She reported that one of the robbers had a real baby face. The press got wind of this, and babyface Nelson was born. Powell broke and confessed to the break-ins and was sentenced to a year on probation. Randall pled guilty and was sentenced to one year to life. Lester went to trial and was found guilty on June 25, 1931. On July 9th, he was sentenced to one year to life in Juliet. Lester kissed his family goodbye and went off to do his time. Once again, he fell in line and became a model prisoner. But in January of 32, he received some bad news. DuPage County was pressing charges on the Itasca bank robber. It only took the jury 30 minutes to find him guilty, and he was sentenced to another one to 20 years. After the trial, Lester was handed over to guard R.N. Martin for transport back to Juliet. They were handcuffed together and took the train back to Chicago and hailed a cab at the station to take him to the prison. A few miles out of town, Lester suddenly pulled a revolver and shoved it into Martin's ribs. He took his weapon and instructed the driver to drive towards Chicago. In the Chicago suburbs, he put the two out, took the cab, and was off. How Lester got the gun, no one knows. Martin believes that someone slipped it into his pocket on the train platform, but Lester would say later that his sister left it for him in the train's bathroom. A few hours later, the police busted down the door of Lester's mother, looking for him. She said, I thought he was with you. Soon he would get in contact with his mother and told her not to worry. He just couldn't go back to jail, and he would rather die. Lester stayed in Chicago until his underworld connections could figure out a way to get him out of town. He was given a ride to St. Louis, where he hopped on a train to Nevada. In Reno, Lester would hook up with some friends of the Tuies and became muscle for their bootleg operation. After he was settled, he sent for Helen and the children. In the summer of 32, Lester got wind that Alvin Creepy Carpus of the Barker Gang was in town. He went to meet Carpus, and the two would hit it off. Carpus was from the same Chicago neighborhood as Lester and was a seasoned bank robber. Lester was interested in teaming up, but Carpus told him that the next job had already been planned. Carpus told Lester that the place to be was St. Paul, Minnesota. The criminals had an unwritten agreement with the city. Gangsters were safe there as long as they didn't commit any crimes there. Many gangs stayed there while they planned their next job. It was the place where all the top guys in the business could be found. If Lester wanted to make it big as a bank robber, that's where he needed to be. In St. Paul, Lester met two of the men that would be influential in his future criminal career, Homer Van Meter and Edward Bentz. Van Meter was a member of what would be called the Dillinger Gang, and Bentz was a 39-year-old bank robber who had been robbing banks for 20 years. He was seen as one of the fathers of modern bank robbery. He turned it into a science. He would pick a bank and sit on it for weeks. He would get the floor plans, investigate the security, map out his escape route, and would not move until everything was just right. He picked his men carefully and never used the same gang twice. Lester met Bentz through a friend, and the older gangster took a light to him. Lester told Bentz that he was trying to pull a few jobs, and he asked for his advice. The old timer told him, first you gotta stay away from the big cities. Small towns are the best, easier to get out of. He said, you need at least three men, but six is better. Three on the inside, three on the outside. A clean getaway car that you can abandon, a box of carpenter nails for pursuing cops, a medical kit, jugs of water, extra cans of gas, a shovel, and an axe. Ben stole Lester that he had his eye on the bank in Greenhaven, Michigan. He said that he was retired and he didn't want to do any more jobs, but he agreed to help Lester case the bank and plan the robbery. He also told him that they would need some heavy artillery, preferably a Tommy gun or three. On June 15th, William Ham, a wealthy bro, was kidnapped off the streets of St. Paul by the Carpus Barker gang. This made the city hot, and most gangsters left town while the heat cooled off. 
Nelson went back to Chicago. One night in the bar, Benz introduced Lester to five men. One of them he called Johnny, who was fresh out of the joint. Johnny was John Herbert Dillinger. He was home from doing 10 years, and at this point, he was not the nationwide celebrity criminal he would become in a few months. He was just getting started. He'd only robbed one bank and a few convenience stores since his parole. But he had big plans, and his focus now was on springing another father of modern bank robbery, Harry Pierpont, from jail. One of the men with Dillinger was Homer Van Meter. Van Meter was also just released from a seven-year stint for armed robbery. He served his time with Dillinger and Pierpont. Nelson and Van Meter quickly found that they had a lot in common. And after a while, he invited Homer to take part in his upcoming bank robbery. But Van Meter had business with Dillinger and declined the offer. Lester did convince Bentz to come along. And on August 18th, Lester, Bentz, and four others stopped a few miles outside of Grand Haven, Michigan. They put on bulletproof vests and checked their weapons. At 2.45 p.m., three men entered the People's Savings Bank. Lester stayed by the door while Bentz went directly to the manager's office. He was supposed to come right back out with the manager at gunpoint, and then they were going to rob the bank. But the manager was on the phone, and Bentz didn't know what to do, so he waited until he finished his call. Meanwhile, Lester was standing in the lobby with a picnic basket. The cashier thought this was odd and asked him if he could help him. Then Lester pulled the Tommy gun out of his picnic basket and told all the cashiers to get on the floor. One of them hit the sign on the lawn. When Benz finally came out with the manager, they cleaned the bank of $2,000 in cash and $100,000 in securities. A worker at the hardware store next door thought something was wrong and he grabbed the shotgun off the wall and approached the bank. When the getaway driver saw him coming, he peeled off, taking with him the gang's extra ammo and maps for the getaway. The men inside noticed their ride was gone, so they took bank employees as hostages and left out the back door. Outside, they were confronted by locals and sheriffs responding to the alarm. With the cops aiming the weapons at the crook, Lester threw his human shield to the side and shots rang out. The clatter of his Thompson submachine gun sent town folks running. Several were grazed by bullets or chunks of concrete propelled by ricochets. They pointed their guns at a woman driving a car full of kids. They forced the woman and the children out and took off in the car. They left a bag containing $100,000 in securities and one man behind, Earl Doyle, who snapped his leg in two places while tussling over his gun with his human shield. Despite the robbery going haywire, Lester was determined to make this his career. But he would never see Bentz again. In October, he would team up with Van Meter and a few other men and rob the First National Bank in Brainerd, Minnesota. The men walked in, pulled Tommy guns, herded everyone into the men's room and left with $32,000. As they left, Van Meter turned back towards the bank and let off a volley of bullets at the door. Lester joined in, shattering the windows of the adjoining stores. They jumped into the car and sped off, still firing at parked cars and storefronts. Like I said, they got away with $32,000 on that day. But in Indiana, that same day, Dylan Jenner's gang got away with seventy-five dollars He wasn't really making a name for himself. Lester took his split and went back to Nevada. Winter was coming and he hated being cold. In January 34, while in Nevada, Lester heard that Dylan Jenner's gang had been arrested in Tucson and John was flown back to Indiana to stand trial. In February, Lester was headed back to St. Paul to plan his next robbery. March 3rd, 1934, John Dillinger made a spectacular escape from the Crown Point Jail in Indiana. Two days later, he was in St. Paul, and Lester and Dillinger decided to join up. On March 6th, they were in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Dillinger and Van Meter stayed in the car. Lester and two others walked into the Security National Bank and announced that this was a stick-up. From the beginning, there was confusion. Lester gave orders to the crowd and another crook gave them different orders, confusing the already petrified bunch. In the chaos, they didn't notice that the switchboard operator was still on the phone. She let it be known that the bank was being robbed. Lester was losing his mind in the bank. He jumped on the counter and said, I'd like to know who set off that alarm. If you want to get killed, just make a move. Dillinger and Van Meter came in and got things in order. The first officer to arrive was taken into the bank at gunpoint. The second was ordered out of his car, and when he didn't move fast enough, the front of his car was sprayed by machine gun fire by the bandit who was posted outside. The sound of the machine gun made Lester run to the window to see what was going on. He hopped onto a desk and saw a third officer, Hale Keith, pulling in front of the bank on his motorcycle. He put his Tommy gun on his hip and shots rang out. Lester released a burst of lead, hitting the officer four times. The officer dropped, and Lester said, I got one, I got one. After they collected the money, they formed the hostages into a circle around them while they walked outside. 
They forced them onto the running board of the car and drove off. The hostages would later say that the thieves were arguing about how to proceed. After a few miles, they were having car trouble. They pulled the car to the middle of the road and stole another car. On March 9th, they were back in Chicago to lay low. A few days later on March 13th, Lester, Van Meter, Dillinger, and four others parked in the back of the First National Bank in Mason City, Iowa. A film crew was setting up to do a documentary, and one of the men ordered them to stop. He said, we'll do the shooting around here. Dillinger and two others entered. Lester stayed outside. Seeing the men enter the bank, the manager tried to run into his office and was chased. He managed to lock the door but was grazed by a bullet shot through the door. The rest of the men entered the bank lobby and announced the robbery. The bank was equipped with a bulletproof security cage. The gang fired at the cage but achieved nothing. The guard was not willing to fire into the crowd, so he fired tear gas canisters into the lobby. In the alley, Lester saw a young man creeping along the wall and told him to stop, but the man did not. And then shots rang out. Lester hit a man named Raymond James in the legs. James was running from the bank after hearing the gunshots. The gang collected $52,000 and again herded the hostages into a protective circle and made their way to the getaway car. Townspeople had already begun to form a crowd outside and many watched from the windows in nearby buildings. One of those watching was Judge John C. Shipley. He grabbed his revolver from his desk and took aim at Dillinger. He shot and hit Dillinger in the shoulder, spinning him around. Dillinger fired his weapon and pulled his hostages closer. The judge caught another one of the gang, Joe Hamilton, in the shoulder when he stepped out of the bank. They hopped into the car with the hostages on the running board and the bumpers. They made their way out of town firing at any police who pursued them. Later that night, the two wounded men were taken to an underworld doctor in St. Paul who patched the pair up. While Dillinger and Hamilton were on the men, Lester and Helen made their way back out west to escape the heat from the police. While they were gone, Dillinger almost got caught while holding up with his girlfriend, Billy Frechette. But they were able to escape along with John Hamilton, but Dillinger caught a slug in the leg. The bad thing was, the cops found the gang's arsenal when they searched the apartment. In April, Lester was back, and the gang began to plan the next robbery. But they needed a new arsenal. So on April 13th, Dillinger and Van Meter walked into the Warsaw Police Department in Indiana with two Tommy guns. They said, we want the guns in the vest. When a cop on duty resisted, Dillinger hit him across the head. He said, we don't want to kill you. They escaped with the department's machine guns and bulletproof vests. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover named John Dillinger public enemy number one, and a $10,000 reward was placed on his head. Lester was named public enemy number two, and there was a $5,000 reward for his arrest. The gang needed a place to lay low. The place they chose was a small resort tucked in the woods of Minnetowish Waters, Wisconsin. It was called the Little Bohemia, and it was owned by Emil Winnetka. Lester, Dillinger, Van Meter, Hamilton, Tommy Carroll, and Pat Charrington arrived in three cars. Lester brought Helen along with him. When the gang got to the resort, Emil noticed that they were wearing shoulder holsters. Dillinger went to him and said, My name is John Dillinger. I know you recognize my face from the papers. We need to stay here for a while. Keep calm and everything will be okay. Over the next few days, Emil was run ragged and was practically a prisoner. Some members of the gang were always awake and he was forced to cook meals and was forced to go into town to get the gang's mail. He wrote a note saying that he was being held hostage by the Dillinger gang. He stuffed the note into a pack of cigarettes and tossed it out the window. Somehow the FBI got wind of the vacation of gangsters and made their way to Wisconsin, led by special agent Melvin Purvis. On Sundays, the Little Bohemia held a popular beer night. And on Sunday, April 22, 1934, the place was packed. People were drinking and dancing, and some of the gang were playing cards in the main house. Outside, federal agents had arrived and were taking up positions, but in the darkness, they failed to surround the building. As the agents fanned out, they saw three men exit the building. They were civilian conservation corps workers, having a good time on that day off. The men got into their car, turned the radio up loud, and began driving towards the exit. The agents assumed that the car was full of gangsters. As it approached them, one of the agents yelled out, Stop! But the music in the car was so loud that the men did not hear them. Again, the agent yelled, and again, the car did not stop. In fact, it sped up. Then shots rang out. The G-men opened up with Tommy guns on the three workers. Eugene Boisino was killed instantly, and his two friends were injured severely. Back in the resort, the good times ended with the sound of the machine guns outside. The gang hopped to their feet, grabbed their guns, and headed to the door. Outside, jumpy G-men were firing wildly at any shadow. Dillinger, Van Meter, and Hamilton took off through the back door and made their escape. 
Lester, who was in his cabin with Helen, grabbed his modified 45 caliber handgun that was modified to shoot automatically and had a Tommy gun grip and a 50 round clip and ran towards the main building instead of trying to get away. He fired his handmade machine gun at Melvin Purvis, who was taking cover on the side of the building. Another agent returned fire at Nelson, sending him running. 90 minutes later, Lester came out of the woods and made his way to a lake house owned by Mr. and Mrs. Paul Lang. As the couple were sitting in the living room, Lester burst into the door and told them to keep calm. Do what I say and no one will get hurt. He told the couple to put on their coats and took them outside to their car and ordered Mr. Lang to drive. The beat up old car was only able to get up to 25 miles an hour. A few miles down the road, Lester realized that he would need a better car. He ordered Mr. Lang to pull over in front of another lake house. He forced his way into the house and commandeered Mr. and Mrs. Alvin Corner. But before Lester came to the house, Mr. Corner called the police to let them know that a strange car was on the road in front of his house. When the car driven by Mr. Corner pulled off, a car full of G-men was pulling up. The G-men pulled their car alongside and told Mr. Corner that they were federal agents. Before they could finish their sentence, Lester hopped out of the car and said, I know who you are, lousy G-men, and I know you guys got vests too. So I'm going to give it to you high and I'm going to give it to you low. And then shots rang out. Agent J.C. Newman, Special Agent W.C. Bound, and Constable Carl Christensen were sitting ducks in the front seat of the vehicle. All three were hit. Bound were there to die of his injuries. During the shootout, the hostages ran and Lester jumped into the car and took off. He drove until the car broke down. And then he walked for miles in the woods until he came across a cabin owned by Maggie and Ollie Catfish, a Native American couple. Lester came to the back door using his best manners and asked could he buy breakfast. For the next few days, he was a guest. He helped the family collect maple syrup and did chores for his meals. And the fact that the cabin was in the sticks with no telephone or radio made him feel comfortable. He stayed for days before Mr. Catfish took him to the highway where he stole another car and made his way back to Chicago. Hella was arrested back at Little Bohemia. She was placed on probation and her request to serve her time in Chicago was granted. She went back home and was placed under surveillance. But it didn't matter. On May 29th, Lester came and got her and the two hit the road. Bonnie and Clyde had recently been killed in Louisiana and Helen saw that for her and Lester and she embraced her feet. The two headed back to the West Coast. While on the lam, Dillinger was still looking to add to the gang. So after a meeting in Buffalo, Charles Arthur Floyd, better known as Pretty Boy Floyd, joined the gang. Now this was an all-star lineup. Four of America's most wanted criminals were all together and ready to raise hell. On June 30th, they rolled into South Bend, Indiana and walked in, guns drawn, to the Merchants National Bank. They walked in and took their positions inside the bank. Dillinger fired into the ceiling and announced this was a holdup. The gunfire was heard by a police officer, Howard Wagner. As he ran to the front of the bank, shots rang out. Homer Van Meter shot the officer. He stumbled across the street and dropped dead. The gang collected $15,000. They surrounded a getaway car with hostages and took off, firing through the back window at police. This would be the first and last robbery of the star-studded lineup. On July 22nd in Chicago, John Dillinger was shot and killed by federal agents after he walked out of the Biograph Theater. On August 23rd, Homer Van Meter was on the corner in St. Paul when he was approached by four police officers armed with shotguns and machine guns. He was ordered to stop, but he took off running. He fired at the cops, but was hit and dropped dead before he reached an alley. Pretty Boy Floyd was shot down in a cornfield in Ohio on October 22, 1934. With the death of John Dillinger, Lester was named public enemy number one. His family was interviewed, and his mother said that she hoped that the police killed him. She didn't want him taken alive. She feared that the cops would torture him. Even up to the end, his mother refused to believe that her son would shoot anyone. It was always the bad boys who was with him that were the trouble. After another trip to the West Coast, Lester was back in Chicago area by November. At 3.30 p.m. on November 28th, FBI agents Ryan and McCade passed the car going along the other direction and noticed two men and a woman. One of them thought they recognized babyface Nelson. In the other car, Lester was with Helen and John Chase. He saw the men in the passing car staring into his car and watched them through the rearview mirror. Ryan and McCade slowed down and made a U-turn. They're after us, Lester said. Instead of hitting the gas and taking off in his newly stolen V8, Lester turned around and went back. The occupants of the two cars stared at each other as they passed a second time. Suddenly, Lester made another U-turn and was behind the agents. He began honking his horn at the stunned agents. Finally, he pulled alongside and shots rang out. 
Chase let loose a burst of lead from his Tommy gun while Lester fired from the driver's side. The officers returned fire and matched the gas pedal and sped off. Two more agents happened to be traveling on that road the opposite way, and they saw the shootout and made a U-turn. They began pursuing Lester's car. One of the agent's bullets hit his vehicle and Lester's car began to belch smoke. Meanwhile, the other car containing the agent Samuel Crowley and Herman Hollis was gaining on them. Chase fired a barrage of bullets out the back window. The agents returned fire. As the car chase approached the entrance to the Barrington Park, the agents gained ground and they pulled alongside of Lester's car. But before they could get a good shot, Lester made a hard right. He stopped the car and told Helen to get out and find cover. She ran to the tall grass and lay down on her belly. Lester got out and began firing. The agents screeched to a halt and made a U-turn and pulled across the road. They grabbed their guns, got out, and took cover. Crowley and Hollis returned fire, and Lester caught one in the side. He retreated back to the front of the car and tried to use his Tommy gun, but it was jammed. He grabbed the Winchester rifle from the back seat and began walking towards the agents, firing. Lester walked through a blizzard of lead without regard. Agent Crowley's Tommy gun jammed, and he tried to retreat to a ditch, but Lester sent a slug through his head, and he collapsed. Hollis also ran. Already hit, he tried to take cover behind a telephone pole. When he aimed his Tommy gun at Lester and pulled the trigger, the gun was empty. He reached for his 38, but before he could get it out, Lester put several slugs into him. Lester then limped back to the agent's car and got in and called out for Helen. Chase grabbed the gang stuff from the disabled car, but Lester said, leave it. Get me to a priest. I'm done for. Helen ran to the car and the trio took off. Helen cradled her mortally wounded husband's head while he directed them to a hideout. There she sat with him until his last moments. He told her to give his love to his family, and then he said, it's getting dark, I can't see you anymore. Around 7.30 p.m., Lester faded away. His body would be found left outside the St. Paul Cemetery, naked and wrapped in a dingy yellow bed sheet and an Indian print blanket. A torn pillowcase was wrapped around his belly and a dirty handkerchief was plugged into a bullet hole. Of the 17 machine gun wounds and 10 shotgun pellets that hit him, the first one to the side was the fatal one. Helen went on the run and became the first woman to make the FBI most wanted list. She would be arrested the day before Thanksgiving and was eventually sentenced to a year and a half in a woman's prison. And that, my friends, is the skinny on Lester Gillis, alias George Babyface Nelson. I hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. Make sure that you bump off that subscribe button, break that thumb, leave a comment, ring the bell, set it for all notifications. And if you want to see the images that I can't show you on YouTube, you got to subscribe to the Few Bad Men Patreon channel so you can see all the videos uncensored. So like I said, we're going to be bouncing around this year. We're going to be doing some different types of gangsters from some different eras and some different times just to keep the channel fresh. All right. Oh, if you want to slide the envelope upstairs to the boss to help the channel run smooth, the link is down below. All right. So this has been a few bad men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies.